Hi, welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is our third or fourth gallery talk as part of the Dream to Reality series. And today we have some special invited guests. Um, I'm going to introduce Jennifer Carroll, who's going to be moderating today's discussion, and I'll let her introduce the lovely guests we have. Um, and I look forward to learning today. So thank you thank, all for being here. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, uh, welcome to everyone here and everyone who will be viewing this on film. We're, we're honored and delighted to have these esteemed people here who are, are all area residents and have joined us today to share the heritage and the culture and the stories of people who have been here for thousands of years. This is part of the Dream to Reality exhibit that features the, the mythological work of artist Kim Rochelle, who grew up in Charlevoix. And part of our ongoing theme is, why do you believe what you believe? And we all know that it's based on our own heritage, our parents, our religion, uh, our, our own personal experience. And, and also what we're saying here is that it's all okay, it's all interesting, and that if we can listen, it's amazing what we will learn, especially if it's different from anything that we've ever known. And so uh, the artist Kim Rochelle has talked a lot about her own beliefs and systems. And uh, today I'm going to ask each of the women here to introduce themselves and uh, then I hope you'll find this is a very interesting conversation and we will definitely open it up for questions. We welcome your own questions <laughs> as we continue. Sandy Witherspoon, please let us uh, kick it off. Hey, hi, I'm Sandy Witherspoon. My traditional name is Shawanademuk, Indigenous cause, and I'm a Makwado Dam, which is a Bear Clan person. And I am, my roots are from here. My, my family have been here for generations, but I grew up in Detroit and would be up here every vacation, every holiday, every summer. My aunties or grandma, or grandma they'd come down to Detroit, get me, bring me up here, I'd be here, and go to Camp Daggett and you know, um, be here the whole summer and then have to go back home for the school year until about 1972 when my grandfather passed and my family decided that I should come here and live with my grandmother so that I could shovel snow and mow the lawn and <laughs> make sure that she was okay. And she lived to be 99 and passed in 2002. And my mother is the last remaining of her ch children. She's now 91 and I spend my time taking care of her when I'm not working. So I'm also, I'm the township clerk here, and uh, so when I'm not busy doing those things, I'm with my mom and we're driving around and uh, going shopping. Now that she's vaccinated, she's happy to be able to get back out and things. But I grew up in a very contemporary setting in a neighborhood in Detroit, Highland Park to be specific, which is no longer, I guess, technically in existence, but has been absorbed by the city of Detroit. <clears throat> but, um, you know, it was a very eye-opening experience going from a, a city where there's diversity to a small town where there isn't. And so I think we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, I live on the land where my grandmother and my mother and previous generations before my grandmother had lived in the last piece of Louis McSabe's allotment. And it's, we still have it. It's on Mount McSabe Road and we're the only dirt driveway <laughs> and um, the house, when we came, I, I, I married to my husband from Minnesota. He's a Minnesota Ojibwe. We came back to Michigan in the 1996 from Minnesota, and we lived in the actual house that my mother and grandmother grew up in. But by that time, it had been, uh, one end of the house was dry rotted, and the other end was waterlogged. It was like you could not save the house. So we ended up taking the house down piece by piece in a respectful manner and keeping some of the boards to incorporate into our new home. And we left the foundation, which is now a garden that has steps leading into it in honor of our relatives that lived there before. So I think there'll be more later. I don't want to talk too long. So, uh, so I'm here and uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for asking. And we'll go from here. We're going to get into this a, a little bit more, but I, I first was very taken with Sandy. She wrote a letter about the importance of the sacred burial grounds in Mount Maxava. And 
I'm going to invite her to talk a little bit more about that as, as we go. Um, but she really, it, it, it made me realize because we all have ancestors, we all have uh, places that we go where we know that our grandparents and our great grandparents are. And that land was threatened where Sandy grew up placing the wreaths on her ancestors' graves. So fascinating, and, and we're just so honored again that you're here. Okay. This is Sandy McSava. Uh, Sandy's great great grandfather was Louis McSava, known as Louis McSavi. Correct. Could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and uh, okay. your... uh, Louis Chief Louis McSavi was my great great grandfather. Growing up, I heard very little stories about him. My grand by the time I was born, my grandpa Dan McSavi, who was the first Native American mail carrier in Shalloway, mm -hmm. town of Shalloway. And um, he was well past retired. Uh, we used to hang out at his house. He didn't tell us much about his wife or his grandfather, Chief Louis McSavi. Most of those stories I heard from my dad were a few, you know, off offhand remarks about Chief McSabe and uh, plus what little I uh, learned from the, um, what was that guy that wrote that book, that Miles? David Miles. David Miles, yeah. They had a picture of Chief McSabe in there and that was more or less the first time I have ever, ever seen that photo. Mm. And he had a picture, they had a picture of my uh, Grandpa Dan in his um, mailman uniform. Uh, didn't really say a lot about the McSabis. Some of the women in town had written that they remember my dad running to one of the north side residents at their house was on fire and that was about it. There was nothing else, you know, mentioned about us. All I did know was uh, Chief McSabi had owned most of the property in Chalvoy. And I know there was a lot of uh, Indian people in Shalloway at that time. I looked in the county clerk's office and I was looking at a different form of spelling Mixabi into Mixaba, which I believe is a correct way of saying Mixabi after speaking to an Ojibwe from uh, Wiki Island. And this kind of surprised the heck out of me, but they said that the Indian language does not have a B sound in it. So I thought, well, how could my name be Mixabi if there's no well, even he was Ottawa. The Ojibwe's are Chippewa. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, that's pretty much what I learned about my parent, I mean my great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather. Plus stories that I'd heard from, you know, different Indians. And I remember, because me and my cousin Donna Washkijik used to always spend all of our time with Dan McSabe and at his house all the time. And once in a while, there'd be a group of Indians that would come to visit him, and they would be speaking in Ottawa. And I, we didn't understand, and we thought, well, that's growing up's doing whatever, so we go play in his backyard. And these people would come, and it's, it seemed to me at the age of seven years old that they were asking him questions, because it would look like he was the main speaker speaking to him. Uh, being as young as I was, I really didn't, you know, know who these people were. But I do know when I had to introduce to myself to the elders when I was younger, they asked me who I was, and I'd say Sandy McSabe. I always have to add Dan McSabe my grandpa, and they go, oh, 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 we know who you're talking about now. But um, that's about all I had to say. I mean, I stayed around Shalway because I love Shalway. I love the beaches. And uh, the history that we had here, and that's why I remained here and didn't move on. Thank you, Sandy. Mm -hmm. This is Yvonne Walker Reshnik. Yvonne is a renowned quill artist. You may have heard of her. Uh, she won the Michigan Heritage Award in 1992 and was named a National Heritage Fellow in 2014. And so we're very honored. All three of these ladies are artists, and we're going to get back into that too in a minute because I imagine many people here are artists or tied to the arts. It, 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 there's some really interesting stories on Yvonne and her work, and one that I was really taken with. Um, she talked about how she was started, her original teachers, in the, the fine art of quill work. And she said, I believe it is truly our responsibility 
to teach others all the best things of our culture. Yvonne? Honey, would you, uh, I'll introduce myself in a language, and it's written down for me by an elder because my biggest handicap in my life is not knowing my language. What I said was, hello, I am Turtle Clan. I am Waganak Sing Odawa, which means I am a member of Little Travers Bay Band. Uh, I am from a place called Pine River, uh, now today known as Shalomoy. Um, and I am an Anishinaabe Kwe. A Binakwe Kwe is my birth name, which means falling leaves woman. And my English name is Yvonne Walker Kishik. Uh, Kishik is a married name. I was born and raised here in Charlevoix, Michigan. Uh, my, both my parents were artists. My father was a wood carver who trained under Kellogg in, from Kellogg Studio in, Char in Petoskey. Mm -hmm. And my mother was a practical nurse, but she was also an artist, a watercolorist. So I attended school <coughs> and graduated in 1965 here in Charlevoix High School. Uh, I left Charlevoix uh, in 19... 65, 67, something like that, um, and never actually moved back. So um, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, I did take my hair down because when it is an honor and you're doing something to honor ourselves and our people, then I undid my hair. That's one of the teachings I had from my mentor. So. Uh, <laughs> so, so when you saw me fussing with my hair and taking the hair tie down, you know, it's because you know that was one of my teachings. So ceremonies and um, leaving your hair down instead of getting all the all the all the all up and tying up, uh, I was taught that we leave our hair loose and free flowing. So Yvonne, we're, we'll be getting more into everyone's art. Uh, you, you told the delightful story of your original teacher and how she taught you the quill work. Uh, do you mind telling that? Um, I, I, was high, I was extremely shy. Uh, when I was in high school, those were the most painful years of my life because I could not speak to other people. I was highly disciplined from a boarding school, which mm -hmm. meant your mouth shut, your feet on the floor, your hands to yourself. So going from a, an extremely strict school to Shalomori High School in the ninth grade where I saw people grabbing each other, kissing by the lockers, and fooling around, running and yelling, mm -hmm. it, I was totally out of my element. So. From ninth grade to twelfth grade, those were very lonely years and sad years for me. Uh, so because of the handicap of being shy, I was hired by a group to go work for the Ottawa Chippewa Arts and Crafts Co-op in Charles and Petoskey on Lake Street. And there is where there were other native people working there and I didn't even talk to them. I was working in a back office and answered the phone. When I answered the phone, the color went from my face straight up, just like a thermometer. You know, I was the only one in there, but I was so uncomfortable talking to someone. You know that, that you know the handicap was extremely serious. So, so that my teacher, my future teacher, was working out in the bigger room, and I could hear them talking. And so one day I went out there and I was watching them work and I said, I think I would like to learn how to do that. And she said, good, I'll teach you. Well, months went by 
you know, we, we left the store on Lake Street and we moved out into Key Gomic. And we opened up the store out there, uh, where the bank is at right now. It used to be Chase Bank, I think, but there was a bank there. And so I went to work one day and she comes in on a Monday and she said, today I'm going to teach you how to do quill work. And I said, good. I went and I sat at the table. No, 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 you're going to learn how I did. You're going to learn from scratch. <laughs> she took me out and back. There was a great big rotten dead porcupine <laughs> in her trunk. It was so bad she couldn't take it off the shovel. She was still on the shovel and laid it on the ground and she said, pull all the quills off this animal. So I started. I learned that day, you know, and I pulled all the quills off and put them in a dishpan. And then I went in there and I said, I think I'm done. She went out there and she looked. Nope, some more. <laughs> so that happened to me three, four more times. So when finally I went in there and I said, I think I'm done. Good, she said, you know. And so I learned that day what, what upwind means and downwind. And <laughs> it was so bad. It was stuck so bad that I wore a mask uh -huh. you know, to pull the porky. And he was such sad shape that we got sticks and we dug a hole right next to the shovel, right in the driveway. <laughs> And we dumped it in there and covered them up and mm -hmm. and then rinsed off the shovel and <laughs> so that was the beginning of my learning process mm -hmm. with uh, Susan Saganabe, who was a full blood Udawa woman from Harbor Springs. Mm -hmm. What I didn't realize is while I worked for them for six years, there was a wall of baskets there, and as we worked, when a basket sold, they took the basket away, but they didn't replace it. So pretty soon that wall was down and I was talking to them and they were talking to me and I was beginning to answer the phone and then finally they said one day, you know, it's your turn. What? You know, somebody came in the door, you know, and nobody got up out there so I knew it was my turn to wait on the customer. And it, and it was uh, really difficult but I did it. So I sold the art piece and owned it and then she began teaching me how to do quill work and you know, how to sort the quills, to wash them, and everything else. So that's pretty much, you know, uh, mm -hmm. of my first six years of training with her. And you later became a teacher yourself. I did, yes. But it's because she said, "When I'm gone, you know, when I'm gone, you're going to be the teacher." Mm -hmm. So uh, I began teaching the day she died, and actually did not know she died. Um, oh, some people knocked on my door and said, you know, can you teach us? And I said, I never taught. I said, I'll try it. So they stayed with me for a week, and at the end of the week, we took our work to market, and that's when I learned that she had died. Oh. The same day the people knocked on my door. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And Sandy, what kind of art do you do? Uh, my art is mostly a uh, pencil. I do portraits, a uh, little bit of animals. I had an exhibit at McEwen Art way back in 19, shoot, I don't know if that was 92 or, might have been 92. And uh, I had six portraits there, and no, seven portraits there. One was uh, from the Dakotas that I had gotten out of a book. But uh, I would I should have brought that pamphlet. I still have a pamphlet of what they had written on there. Um, but what they commented on on how my artwork looked looked like it was a photograph and it could almost come alive. Mm -hmm. It's like wow. But I they asked me how I did it. It's just like when you're looking so much at a person's face. After a while, you can kind of get a feel your imagination gets in there and you think about how that woman lived, all the lines on her face and how she wore her braids and what ornaments she had on them and how hard her life may have been coming, knowing where she, you know, which tribe she came from out north. She looked like to be a grandmother, her face was all lined. And I did that one just to see if I could do the wrinkles. She had a thousand wrinkles on her face and I gave that picture to my mom. And I had done another one of a warrior with his rifle leaning against him, and he has a full moon behind him. 
And I think that one sold, and I haven't seen that one since. Another one I had was a a dancer, and he had bells around his ankles, and you can see the people behind him. But I had, I was impressed with the bells myself at how they came out. I mean, I like that that's pretty. pretty <laughs> <you know? laughs> and I haven't seen that picture either. Even though when they did the exhibit, the people added sold those uh, drawings to the were happy to bring them to my exhibit. I wish I hadn't taken pictures of them, but I was just all excited, so I don't remember to do things that I'm supposed to do when I get excited. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy, out of curiosity, where did you go to school? Charlevoix. Charlevoix and uh, briefly in Grand Rapids and in South Haven. Were, uh, so you attended the boarding school? No, 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 And no. you were in public school. I, I know Yvonne was mentioning that she did initially. No. Yeah. I, I didn't go to boarding school, but I did do one year in Catholic school because I had to finish my Holy Communion. And then I got sent back to public school, so I was the only native child in public school where all my cousins and brothers and sisters went to the Catholic school. Mm -hmm. Why I was just the only one sent to the public school, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Even the teachers were wondering. <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember being in public school, being in first grade, where someone had brought me, brought me out of my class and sent me to where they do stuff for the library. It's like a little volunteer child and stuff. Well, while I was down there, the woman I was working with kept asking me about Indian stories. What stories do I remember my mom and or my grandpa telling us? And it's like, nah, I don't remember any stories. You know, it's, mm. my grandfather didn't sit us down and tell us any stories that he remembered from his parents. Mm. But and so back upstairs I went. I think I think you may know that Louis McSabe traveled to Washington D.C. many times to speak for the tribe. Mm -hmm. They still have letters. No, letters exist. Mm -hmm. that he had written. That was enough. He was an educated man. He could yeah. read and write, and yeah. he Edu advocated for the people. Education was very important to the McSabe family. And keeping their traditions more or less, and you know, keeping our lineage native. And, and at the time, if you can imagine speaking one language and then realizing that you had to learn English so that you could fight for the right to stay where you and your family had lived all these yeah. years, that's, that's what his experience was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, there was a lot of natives in Chalaboy back, back in those days. I went to the county clerk's office one day to try to find the real pronunciation of her name, because it goes from Mixabi to Mixaba. And um, I looked, while well, I was looking through the pages, and I looked at some of the names in there, and they were like that long. Mm -hmm. And so I can understand why they wanted to have them changed to native names, like Lewis and John, and what yeah. are the other ones? Case. Uh, Case, uh, geez, there's a lot of names that they had picked up in it went back to because their names are so long that they want them to have more English speaking names easier to pronounce. But yeah, there was quite a few Nishnabs living in this community on Bay Shore, Horton Bay. Horton Bay had a, quite a few. Um, Hemingway had written about natives being around him in some of his books. And in uh, Bay Shore, I met a woman while I was working in uh, Boyne City who said her grandpa spoke, flew in Ottawa. He ran the general store in Bay Shore, and that's how he learned the language. He said there's many, many families that lived out there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, most of them are all gone now. There's only a few of us left here. John Town. John Town, yeah, that was another one. Carpenter Street. Yeah. So Sandy Witherspoon uh, grew up in Detroit, but you said that you also felt alone when you were growing up and, and then learn more about your culture later? Well, my, you know, my mother was a Catholic and my family chose Christianity, but I had a radical older sister who went to U of M and got involved with AIM and different active, activist activities and was a very big influence on my life and got me to question Catholicism and want to seek my own people's ways, spiritual ways and teachings. So I um, chose a different path 
and it was kind of difficult because you know my mom and all of them try to guilt trip you and aren't you going to church and all this mm-hmm. and I'd say no I'm not and so <laughs> um, but uh, I came here and I you know learned more about our culture here so we tried to go to you know just find out where the ceremonies were who different people were to talk to and to learn things and ask my grandmother about different things and where she did, did tell where me did your grandparents things. meet? My grandmother never was, she wasn't forced to go to boarding school, but um, when she was older, she chose to. And so she wanted, because really at that time, she was born in 1904, and um, she lived, like I said, where I live now. And uh, she chose to go to boarding school, and she went for one year down by Mount Pleasant. There was a boarding school. And she met my grandfather from, uh, he was a Choctaw, Oklahoma Choctaw, whose family had been removed from the Mississippi, well, he was Mississippi Choctaw, and his family, his grandmother and his parents had been forced to leave and move to Oklahoma. So he was in Oklahoma and had been shipped off to this boarding school. And um, that's where they met. And so we, you know, he came up here to live with her and they had four daughters and the last of their daughters, my mother is my mother who's still alive today. But um, I would like to talk about the artwork that I do. Sure, please. And I'm honored to have been an apprentice under Frank Edouagizic, a prior chairman of the Little Traverse Bay Band. And I do woodland pottery, which is uh, native clay of Michigan and different, uh, um, oh, we use different, uh, I can't think of the, the, we call it salt and pepper rock. It just kind of crumbles when you pick it up, and, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I do that type of pottery, and it's done outside in a wood fire, just a regular wood fire, a very hot fire, and it's a dying art, which is why Frank, you know, re- kind of revived it, and he had come across some pot shards, and he was a potter to begin with. He had a shop down there called Pipigua Pottery in Carlin, and I bought a place in Interlochen and worked for the Grand Traverse Band at that time. And so he had approached me as to whether I would like to learn how to do pottery, and he got some sort of grant. And as it turned out, Yvonne, Yvonne and I were both in this... Uh, oh, the heritage wood. Yeah, and it was uh, Sisters of the Great Lakes, and it was Native women mm-hmm. from around the Great Lakes, and all everybody did a different type of art. Mm-hmm. And so I had the fortunate experience to learn through him. And that's what the kind of art I do. I'm not, I've never been able to draw, you know, that you're <laughs> such an awesome artist. And I've never been that type of artist. I, I, I like clay and I like to gather it, you know, find it, go around. I think we got clay from like the South Manitou Island and the Beaver Island. I like to travel around and, and I don't do it now as much as I, you know, should I put it away for a long periods of time and because life becomes too hectic. Yes, and very so I'm, soothing and Yeah, kind and of. if I don't like it, I can smash it mm-hmm. and start over, you know? Yeah. So, but I haven't been doing that lately, but I look forward to getting back into it as my life becomes less hectic. So, I hope you do. You know, I think I think everyone here who does art knows that, that you go in and out of it, but it's such a wonderful feeling yeah. when you yeah, get, you're inspired to, to do it again. So I would, uh, I, I would like to touch a little bit again on how I first was introduced to Sandy Witherspoon. And actually I see Joanne Bierman is here. Thank you for coming too. Uh, Sandy and, and Joanne are friends and uh, started writing during the time that the city was seeking affordable housing and, and looking at the allotment that was uh, Chief McSaba's at the time and, and uh, learned then it was a sacred burial ground. And so Sandy wrote a letter that I don't think was ever published, but, but Joanne brought it to my attention, and I want to thank you for that, and said, I'd like to ask more on the importance of providing protection of this land. The relatives are buried there. This land is, the, this is from Sandy. This land is the last of Chief Lewis McSabe's allotment from the 1855 treaty. So this was his land, his allotment, that, went, that grew smaller and smaller and smaller, but somehow stayed protected. It's just north of town, and we'll get to exactly where that is in a minute. It has remained relatively undeveloped and undisturbed for the last 165 years. 
my grandmother and great-grandmother used to place floral wreaths on the graves of our ancestors buried in these woods. Which I thought was beautifully said. And, and could you share more about the land today? And uh, the, as, as you were growing up, you saw the children playing on it. It was also a, a place uh, to go and, and remember your heritage. Well, I used to go gather beech nuts there with my aunts mm -hmm. and, uh, along the golf course that's on the north side. and. The, used to also encompass the golf course because people on Division Street, there's a house there who uh, said her father said they had burials in their backyard. Mm -hmm. And he was the original, I guess, the man who was uh, hired to put in the golf course. Mm -hmm. So he knew that they were there and he told his daughter about it. But um, we used to take walks on the wood, the trees, the trails there, the big beech trees, which are now gone. Something has happened to the beech trees, and pretty much they're all gone, those huge beech trees that used to be there. Yeah. Or we used to go there and catch night crawlers to go fishing at night, and they'd have the sprinklers on and go yeah. down <laughs> go out there and get a bunch of night crawlers to go fishing. And I was a summer kid here, so I just thought that was the greatest thing. And it's and, matured into a canopy, you said, of trees? Yes, and so it's always been there. We probably, you know, we shouldn't have been playing in the sand traps and stuff, but we did. <laughs> and we had a great time. And there's a number of people who, um, you know, uh, you know, that land has always just been the way it is since the golf course has gone, and the golf course is one of the oldest in the country. And that if it were not for the golf course, that land probably would not still be undeveloped. So I'm really grateful that there was something there as, that afforded the land some protection from development. And so it still remains. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the graves, you know, in places where the people are buried are, you know, unmarked or, mm -hmm. you know, my mother and my grandmother, they knew where they were because they would go out there and place those wreaths. But, you know, as a summer kid and things, I didn't, you know, when I was a kid, pay much attention at that time, and I wish I had. And there was an older woman, and she worked at the Harsha house, Phelps, who told me that she also knew about these. And so I know there's other people out there that know that these exist. And so I'm just really grateful that <clears throat> proposal two or pro whatever the proposal was, I'm really grateful that it failed. And I hope that's enough um, to protect the land and going into the future, but I'm not, you know, it's nothing is, is a sh for sure, you know. So I'm hoping I'd ask little Travis to get involved, and they have to an extent where they flew over and they had some sort of thing that could capture images and came over and walked and looked around and found, you know, different things I didn't even notice that were there before. So I think they're on it and they might you know, continue to, do, to mo do more research, but not go around and digging people off or, you know, but to si find some way to protect that piece of land going forward. One of the important. things that we talked a lot about is there's, there's so much rich history here. In an hour, we, we obviously don't have time to get into all of it, but this is part of a very important ongoing continuing conversation. And, uh, and we hope uh, that more people will be interested in many of the stories that we're telling today. So we really appreciate all of them came on their own to share some of this with us. And one of the things that uh, they've asked me if, if we could delve into is racism um, that they've experienced in their lives. And so I, I'd like to start with Yvonne. Um, can you tell us about what, it, about what you've experienced? Um. I was born here in Charlevoix in 1946. I, uh, I grew up seeing the signs, so Charlevoix the Beautiful, but within the Indian community, all the native people, we called it Charlevoix the Bigoted. And, and, I, and I, it, it took me a while, I had to look it up, see what it meant. You know, I, it was the older people that I heard say that. And, and didn't know what it meant. But the first time I, my first experience with racism was when we ran home from school with a paper saying that we could sign up for brownies, you know, to become a Girl Scout. So we, we got my mother's, okay, you know, she signed the papers and it was turned back in. They told us the date where, where we should go for the first meeting. And so we went there 
there was a house on Bridge Street, only a block from where we lived, and uh, we knocked on her door and we said, we're here to sign up for the brownies. And she said, just a minute. She closed the door. And so we just stood there. Pretty soon we were sitting on the steps waiting. Other people came and knocked on the door and they were let in. And so we still sat out there because she didn't tell us come in. <laughs> and it happened a lot. So, so three or four more girls came and signed up for brownies. By then we could hear them in there, all right, we're calling, going to call this to order, you know. And, we're, and uh, we could hear the lady offering milk and cookies, mm -hmm. but nobody came to let us in the door. And it dawned on us that they didn't want us in their house. So we walked back to our house and we told our mom, you know, that they won't let us in. Mm -hmm. And so she said, Oh, you know, she didn't know what to tell us, you know, so maybe they, they're they full, you know. She didn't know what to tell us. So when my uncle came home, Pete, Uncle Pete, and we told him, and he laughed and he said, you don't need to sign up for brownies. He says, you're already brownies. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but that was my first experience with with it in Charlotte, and then, you know, throughout the rest of my life then, I kept coming across it too, and um, there are ways to get past that. Uh, I tell the story because it, it was hurtful, and yet my uncle turned it around and said, you know, made us laugh, you know, because of that. So, we need to do the same thing today, you know, you know, if somebody calls us a derogatory name, what we consider derogatory, like they call us chief, well, the response today might be, thank you for calling me chief. I am not a chief, that's an honorary title. I'm a plain old ordinary, everyday American Indian woman, you know. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways, you know, to deal with it. You know, and, and the one, you know, I looked it up in the dictionary, the word is still in the dictionary, it's squaw. Mm -hmm. uh, the squaw is not even a part of our language. It's a word that mm. Europeans picked up. It's a Narragansett word, which means it's a derogatory. It means a female part of the body between the legs. Mm. So that has nothing to do with us. They're just calling a bad name. So there are different ways, you know. To, the other one was a uh, tribe. You know, we call it, you know, We've been being called tribes, and that's a misnomer brought to us by the Mormons, who thought we were the last lost tribe. So we are actually not Jewish tribe, we're Anishinaabe. So in a good way, we explain how to deal with names like that, you know, so, uh, and we try to, you know, that's one way of dealing with it is to educate, which is the best way to deal with problems. And to learn to speak, you know, from the heart and how we feel. Thank you. Sandy McSaiba, could you share your experience? Mm, the first memory of being, of even realizing I was native, my dad made me a big sandbox out in the back of the house, and I used to love playing in there. I had my toys and stuff, and I had two older brothers at the time. They were always off someplace, and so I spent my time in my little sandbox while well, some little neighbor girl came came over and she wanted to play in my sandbox while well, she mostly wanted to play with my toys not play with me and then she had my favorite toy and I told her to give it back to me and I you know insisted that's my favorite toy I want it back well she didn't want to give it back so I went over and I took it from her well when I did that she was just you know and then she gets out of the sandbox and throws the other toys at me and calls me an Indian it's like <laughs> I don't know, yeah, she called me like, oh, you old dirty Indian or whatever, but mm -hmm. I was like, what the heck, you know? And I'm a peaceful little girl, and then she walked off, and I started realizing that I'm not like the white kids down the, down the way. I mean, you know, we didn't play together. There were some neighborhood kids that came and played with me, but I seldom let any of the insults they 
gave me on the walks home from school, you know, calling me names. I turn around and beat them up, and <laughs> so didn't have too much trouble. <laughs> you know, they thought they were all tough, and they thought they were gonna, you know, beat me up being a little Indian girl. And some of them would be boys, and I'd just knock the heck out of them. Right <laughs> so I didn't really face a lot of that just because I was the only native going to public school at the time, and I had to fight for myself. Plus, I was really good in sports. So people always wanted me to play basketball, baseball, whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so they weren't as hard on me as they were my sister. My little sister was very, very shy and very meek. And I was always sticking up for her because people liked to pick on her because she was so shy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like that. But that was first. There's numbers of cases of being, and you look at the people that are being racist to you, it's like, it's no use arguing with them or telling them who you are because they are so hell-bent on believing what they believe, mm -hmm. that we are Satanists, Satan people. Uh, Dirty, yeah. Yeah, that, that we weren't worthy to be in their civilization or some sort of like that. And it's like, you can't change those people. I mean, mm -hmm. they need a life experience to happen to them mm -hmm. to realize that, you know, these people are real after all, you know. You still see it, you know. I still see it. Shalavoy, East Jordan was a bad one. <laughs> I had lived there for a year and a half, and when we first moved in the town, they were just, you could tell, you know, they waited on you last and kind of farted around before they got to you, and you're standing waiting because you need this, what you came to the store for, you need this, so you're waiting for this person that's being very rude to you. It's like, well, you're, you're trying to, hurt my feelings and try to make me feel third class and it's like I'm not I'll wait I'll play your little game for as long as you want but after a while they found out that you know we were good people hard-working and after a while they're sticking up for us and you know it just takes time for people to get to know a non uh, uh, a native in uh, they realize that you're a human being, a person, and you have a personality, and you have children, and you love your children, your grandchildren, you care for your grandparents, and uh, you don't want anybody ever hurting them, and you try to raise your children so they don't, they know how to work for themselves to look at these people while they hurt your feelings, yeah, but they're maybe not very happy themselves, and they're just trying to hurt somebody else, so got to look at it that way. Thank you, Sandy. Mm -hmm. And Sandy Witherspoon. Well, I was an eye-opener for me to move here year-round, to go to school here, and to be assumed, you know, be placed in special ed type classes with her before they got my transcripts. When it was decided that I would stay up here, they didn't have my transcripts. My aunt took me down to uh, get enrolled. And so I was put into some of these questionable classes and I was, you know, they, I was really like, wow, you know, are these guys this far behind, you know, kind of thing. And uh, <laughs> so then they got my transcripts and then they had to back paddle. And it turned out I had more credits than the kids that I was going to school with. And I was allowed to take classes in Petoskey because you had to stay in school all day back then. They wouldn't let you just take a morning class and leave or whatever. You had to stay in the school all day. So, um, it was, there was the height of the fishing wars in the 70s. I was clueless. My father is a non-native. He's a sports fisherman down to date. <laughs> and so he would be out, you know, I would just have never imagined this. And I came here and, because um, I'd gone to school with kids from Lebanon and Cambodia and all these places, you know, and Detroit Public Schools is a very diverse place. And so I had no clue, other than my time here in the summer, I went to Camp Daggett, and you know, I went to, spend, most of the time I just spent with our family, cousins, yeah. I mean, we didn't, I didn't know any other kids that weren't my relatives. So when I did, and I went to public school, uh, I was shocked at some of the uh, teachers, and shocked at, uh, you know, some of the kids, and like Sandy said, it's not everybody, there's a, there's a lot of good people but there were those individuals who were that way. And it was a reality, and it still is. I mean, it still is. It's, uh, you know, I think at times racism can be very subtle. And in a way, I'd rather be at 
blatant, so at least I know where they stand versus subtle, where it's all kind of hidden and under the under the wire, you know. But it exists, and it, I was shocked, you know, because I was spit on, and I was, and then I was the one standing there feeling humiliated, and mm -hmm. and you know, I was just like, wow. So luckily, I'm very. Uh, I guess, I don't know what the word is. I guess I'm just not the type to be pushed around. So you know, I didn't accept that and I would say things. And so that's how I dealt with it and that's how I still deal with it and I go forward from there. And as I say, there are a lot of good people, but there are those and I think, you know, like Sandy said, they must be unhappy people or have things going on in their own life. You kind of just have to, to, if they have to be that way, if they act that way, why, you know, I don't understand why that would be mm -hmm. and I've seen it extended toward kids in the public schools and different you know I've been I have, most of my work has been in the field of substance abuse prevention with native kids mm -hmm. and I used to run camps for native kids and my goal was to expose them to as many opportunities and as I could mm -hmm. and we would you know go on these trips to the Chicago Art Museum and the aquarium and take them out and see the world mm -hmm and to say there's more out there, you know. And so I just wouldn't accept that or be treated that way, so. Yeah, you did a good job when you had the camp out in Alden. That My kids fun. went there, they loved it. Told okay, stories, fun. told them about their culture. Kind of flying kites and doing things that kids do, out canoeing, oh, they loved it. That camp was thriving, Sandy was running. Oh, <laughs> that was fun, great time. So we have uh, just a few more minutes, and uh, is, is, would anybody like to ask any questions or, or to build on some of what we've already talked about? I have a question. Leslie. Um, could each of you explain what your first language was? English. English. Was English for you? Did you learn Amish Nebuch? No, that was taken away from us, okay. from our grandparents. Okay. Our, my grandparents could speak, and then my parents were forced to speak English. Right. And so, I'm, my grandmother was fluent, and I don't know if any of you remember Jay Oliver and um, Clara Walker, and you know, I would love to sit there, Isabel, his mother, mm -hmm. I'd love to sit there and listen to them talk, but I, you know, I would only, could we only pick out, I would ask, well, what does that mean, what does that mean, you know, and a lot of times they did that, so they didn't want us to know oh, what they were talking about, yeah. you know, <laughs> unfortunately, but, so, then, you know, as I grew, you know, you learn a few words here and there. Mm -hmm. And now in the, the tribal you know, programs with, through the like Grand Traverse Band, Little Traverse Bay Band, the Anishinaabe language is uh, being taught. Yeah. And it's online and it's a very difficult language uh, to learn because there's he, you know, there's a male, female uh, mm -hmm. term, you know, differences in, in the way we speak. Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, conjugation of, you know, it's just, it's a challenge, but yeah. there are people there are still fluent speakers, and there are people who actually have learned from going to these classes mm -hmm. to become fluent speakers. Yeah. So I wish I was that disciplined, or you know, uh, but I'm not. So because yeah, <laughs> I. I know that there are opportunities out there, and I do have a neighbor who speaks. You know, there are people fluent, fluent speakers, mm -hmm. so that's a great thing because, you know, I think you know if your language dies, you know, a lot of the time you know they say your culture is gone. But we, we are rebuilding that, and I think that it's very, mm -hmm. opera, you know, it's, oh, I can't even think of the word. Hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a moment, I just want to hear what your oh, first language. Um, my father, uncle, the, well, they were fluent. Then they used to speak it in front of us, but because they went to boarding schools, they didn't want us to learn it because they didn't want us to get beaten like they were beaten. So we didn't learn it. So the first time I heard it, my father and uncle were talking, and it was very serious. I could tell by their voices. And my sister Donna and I was in the dining room, and, and I said, what is that, Pig Latin? She says, no, she's not. She says, I, I know Pig Latin. You know? So it's something else. You know? so, uh, so after Pete left, you know, I, uh, we went in the back in the kitchen and we said, what was that language you were speaking? And he said, I was speaking our language, he said, and, and he said, uh, 
a, a member of our family died, he said, but you don't know her. So he said, you know, we didn't want you kids to hear who it was. Oh, you know. And so Donna said, well, why, could, why didn't you teach us? And he said, because I didn't want you to be beaten like we were beaten. Yeah. So um, it, it is, they are correct. It is very difficult to learn. I think the quickest way to learn is go to Canada and kidnap an Indian speaking language, you know, man, and bring him back home and <laughs> let him go after I become fluent. <laughs> so, so, so quickly, we do have some questions. Joanne, did you ha have a question? Oh, I just wondered if, um, I know that there are a couple books or at the library that you can take out that are very informative and that are written. And I'm so bad, I don't know if I should say by, by Indian people, Ashna, Anishinaabe people, Ojibwe people. It's so hard to know. I want to be correct and respectful. But there's some really good books in the library. One is um, The Three Fires. Oh, look, you've got one of them. That so this is the uh, history of the little Travers Bay area. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is so. crazy wonderful informative. Yeah, and there's a lot of our mm -hmm. relatives here. Yep. In this book. And so, just just so that people c can know, it's by James Mc McLaren. McLaren. The, the way it happened. And the personal interviews with different families. No, if you're curious, you know, and you think you want to know if they're native, you could ask them, "Are you Nish?" Which is oh, it, yeah. it is slang for Anishinaabe. Mm -hmm. oh, that was are notorious for using slang words. If you hear two Native people saying, Bama P, when they're leaving, uh, and, and the response might be, Bama, you know. <laughs> what they're saying, since we don't have a word for goodbye, we're saying, see you later. And, you know, Bama is also the slang word for see you later. <laughs> yeah. So. A lot of words were shortened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I explained that to a woman in a drugstore the other day, you know, and that's, you know, the best way, I think, is to inform people and let them know so that you don't have to worry. So we, so we have time for a couple more questions. Yes. I, I guess it's not a question. Maybe it's just a comment. Um, I spent many years at conferences in the Southwest, in Santa Fe and Albuquerque and that area, and there is so much done to teach and explain the history. Um, and there seems like Michigan has a very rich Native culture and very little is done mm -hmm. to, to showcase that in some way. I mean, I think the most people can do is you can go to the library or you can go to Ward Nice, you know, and <laughs> go in the back room and look at what they bring from Santa Fe um, uh -huh. yeah. or the store outside Petoskey, but I don't think we do a very good job of mm -hmm. Right, I inquired. I, don't know how, but we don't. I inquired about the mural, and I think you know. Um, I asked you know about when it went up, and this is the mural uh, on, on Rexall, Rexall right. which yeah. depicts uh, yeah. Charlevoix mm -hmm. history. And so, it just you know seemed unfortunate that right. they could have had an opportunity to you know relay the history of the area and mm -hmm. be inclusive, and it just was kind of overlooked. So. So we hope again. This is this is a continued conversation that it won't stop here. That that anybody who's interested can help us tell the story much better and be much more aware. And I saw yes, another question. Um, I was wondering what were the circumstances that you went to boarding school? You said you went back to <laughs> public school by the ninth grade. How many years were you in boarding school? Did your parents? send you there? Were you made to go there by, an, by the government? Or? We were, um, my parents separated when I was in second grade. And so my father tried to raise us by himself, you know, uh, there were uh, four girls, tried to raise us by himself, by himself. And uh, the babysitters were not the best of babysitters, you know, they wanted to be paid with a bottle of wine. And so when they drank the bottle of wine, then they left to go someplace else, you know. Mm -hmm. And so to get more wine or something else to drink, alcoholism was rampant in Charlevoix when I was a kid. And 
And because of that, um, my sister Donna went next door and she pounded on the door and it was snow on the ground in her underpants and she knocked on that door and she said, you got some food, I'm hungry. And she called the police and she called the church and they came and gave us baths and they gave us food. And it's the first time I saw Santa Claus, you know, it scared the hell out of me. I ran to the <laughs> uh, But they brought in a bunch of food and then they ended up taking my dad to court because he, you know, he was absent from the house and our babysitter left us alone. The stove was out and so they charged my father with neglect and forced him to send us to boarding school or they would take us and put us up for adoption. Wow. So we went to boarding school and he paid $10 a week for our care at the boarding school. And if he didn't have the money, he took them apples by the bushel or he took deer meat there. He would hunt and kill deer meat, take it to the school. And then it was shared by everybody. But uh, so we went there for eight years. I got out of there in the eighth grade and then from there went to the high school. Just so, so I think, you know, obviously, this is just touching on a, a lot of fascinating veins. Uh, and as we close, I wonder, uh, th you were all sharing a, a little bit about how many tribes, <laughs> to excuse the word, th that exist in Michigan. Could you touch on that? Because I thought that was very interesting. I think Sandy should answer that. No, well, there's, no there's 12 federally recognized tribes, but there's also mm -hmm. Burt Lake, which is over by... The Little Travis Bay Band, and they have applied for recognition and have been denied um, and told that they should just join the Little Travis Bay Band, but they're a specific community and they should be recognized as, you know, as same mm -hmm. as the Grand River is also not recognized. Mm -hmm. Grand River Band is a large uh, band of Native people. And <clears throat> unfortunately, I think. Um, they probably will not be able to. I mean, it, it, it gets to assume then that, okay, um, they should join Little River. You know, I don't know why that would be that they don't want to recognize any more tribes, but there are other tribes, or, you know, groups, Native Anishinaabe communities that are not federally recognized, but exist, so. And we haven't touched on this, but historically, the villages always were on the water because of the reverence for the water and the environment. And uh, so you can imagine that when you're, you're raised on the water, your livelihood is, is everything about the water, and then you're told that you need to move to a state with no water, what that felt like. And so that was the beginning, I think it was a good question about boarding school, that was the beginning of, of saying we, we need to stay here, no, our ancestors are here, the water is here. In order to do that, they were said, fine, but you need to give up your culture and your religion. You need to go to our boarding school. And that was in the mid-1800s? Oh, uh, no, there's people earlier? my age. There are people my age who remember their mothers chasing the car um, in Peshawbi Town. Yeah, the boarding school in Harbor Springs opened in 1829. There you go, yeah. And it continued into the, what, 1973. 1973? Wow. Yeah. So, so all those generations were, were, were told, please don't celebrate your culture. And uh, it's really this generation that has started to celebrate and speak up. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think you used the word hope. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good word. Mm -hmm. So we will, because we're a little past time, and I want to be respectful of that, um, we'll, we'll stop, we won't end. Uh, we'll hope that you'll continue. I know a couple more of you would like to ask questions and please feel free, we'll, we'll all be here. But I just want to thank you very much. Thank these women. Thank you. Thank you. And Chi McWetch, which is thank you very much. Chi McWetch. Chi McWetch. And hello. Sandy taught me this. No. McWetch. Midwich? No, McWatch is. I knew I would miss it. <laughs> Buju is hello, Anani is hello. Okay. Those are good words to start with. Yeah, sometimes you say, I need a native. They're like, did you learn that? You've been around Indians, haven't you? <laughs> Mission out bad. And then they'll start talking, and then they'll be a little bit more open to your yeah. questions if you have any. It's funny because I was going through the drive through at Kentucky, you know, Pride and Petoskey, and the guy goes, 
you know, miigwech, you know, that wait, he's <laughs> waiting through the window. So the language is getting out there yeah, and people yeah. are learning it. And it's not yeah. just Native people who are taking the classes, mm -hmm. so that's really encouraging. Mm -hmm. Very much. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you again. Thank Thanks you. all for coming.